Good evening, everybody. My name is Jaga Richter. I'm a climate scientist at NCAR and the lead organizer of the NCAR Explorer series. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to NCAR's MESA laboratory and a second lecture in the NCAR Explorer series. NCAR, or the National Center for Atmospheric Research, is a world leading organization dedicated to the study of the atmosphere, the Earth system, and the sun. The atmospheric and related sciences are of critical importance to society, especially in our rapidly changing environment. At NCAR, we recognize the importance of communicating the findings of our research that directly influence the world and the people around us. Our scientists and engineers in the NCAR Explorer series present their research findings to you, the public, at a local level, and we extend the reach of these talks to a global audience through our live web stream and archive presentations on UCAR Connect. Thank you for taking the time this evening to join us, and we look forward to answering your questions and hearing your comments and the Q&A directly following the lecture. Today's speaker is Dr. Bruce Carmichael. Dr. Carmichael studied mathematics as an undergraduate at the University of New Mexico. He received a master's in applied mathematics from Northwestern University and a PhD in computer science from University of Maryland. After completing his PhD, Dr. Carmichael started working for a Washington-based consulting company. Two years later, his wife encouraged him to get a hobby, and Dr. Carmichael started taking flying lessons from the Baltimore Washington Airport. He proceeded to get a pilot's license and has flown for fun, never for pay, with his wife and children ever since. Dr. Carmichael's professional career over time evolved towards the aviation industry. He worked for a Naval Air Test Center building software and then continued as a software engineer for a company that worked with the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA. While holding the job, he met the Director of Research Applications Laboratory at NCAR, and shortly afterwards accepted an engineering director position. Currently, Bruce serves as a program director of the Aviation Applications Program at NCAR, overseeing the efforts of nearly 70 people. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bruce Carmichael. Yaga, thank you very much, and <clears throat> thank all of you folks for um, to coming up this evening. Um, we had uh, we had a session on Saturday afternoon. Some of you may remember Saturday, um, <clears throat> and surprisingly enough, we had a, a pretty good showing in the room. Um, so, uh, but there was a special bonding. All of us had sort of slogged up in the snow, and and it was sort of ugly. Uh, tonight's a really beautiful night to be out. Uh, I'd like to, um, first of all, thank uh, Yaga and, and her team for all the good work they've done in, in putting this together and making it work. They've just, uh, they made everything easy for those of us who are presenting. Um, question, how many of you in the audience are pilots? Raise your hand if you're a pilot. Okay. I'm guessing 15? That's about the same uh, same uh, size of group we had of pilots uh, when we did this on Saturday. So we uh, appreciate the pilots being up here. The only um, jeopardy in, in having you guys here is that when I mess up, you know, you're going to know right away and, and you're going to call me on it. So I'll try to be careful. Um, <clears throat> so I, uh, I direct a, a research group. I want to say, first of all, that what I'm presenting are, uh, are the things that our group uh, has done. So I'm representing the work of a number of, of uh, researchers in the Research Applications Lab. Uh, and I'm not representing my own work here, but I hope I will do them justice as, as I show you uh, uh, aviation. Um, <coughs> so first of all, The thing you see in the background there is what we call a microburst. Now, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, that, that name was not part of the jargon. 
But uh, there were airplanes that were uh, falling out of the sky on takeoff and landing, big commercial airlines. And there was something happening that people didn't quite understand. So NCAR, along with other research organizations, uh, were sponsored by the FAA to go in and do the research to try to figure out what the problem was, exactly what was happening in the atmosphere. Now, um, here is, let me play that uh, clip, and you'll see at the end of the clip, uh, sort of a, a real-time microburst. Uh, watch it, watch it as it unrolls for about 20 minutes uh, here on the, on the clock. And you look at that and you say, oh, that looks really ugly, right? And what pilot would really like to fly through that? Now, what exactly what is this microburst thing that we're talking about? Let me explain to you what the issue is. Um, so think of uh, having a, a large bucket of water and you pour it out on the ground and it's just sort of, as it hits the ground, it goes every which way. Um, now imagine that you're an airplane and you're on approach to the runway and you've got the wheels down, you've got the flaps down and you're going pretty slow. And now pilots are trained that when they're landing, they wanna, they wanna stay on the glide slope and they wanna maintain a target airspeed. So everything is just fine. And then suddenly they encounter a headwind when they enter this microburst. And so suddenly their airspeed goes up and they may start to rise above the glide slope. So pilots are taught instinctively to reach over and pull the power back. And so that will slow it down and get it back on the glide slope. Now about the time they get that done, they get to the middle of this thing and now there's no longer the headwind, now it's uh, a downburst. And suddenly they lose airspeed and they start descending below the glide slope. And then, as they're pushing the power up, that becomes a tailwind. And so now they really lose airspeed. And so, so they're pushing the power up, but they're sinking on the glide slope. And if they can't get the engine spooled up quickly enough, then they pancake into the ground. So uh, what does that look like? It looks like that. There are a number of those accidents that occurred in the late 70s, 80s. Uh, this one happens to be uh, in 1988 in Dallas. So the research community figured out uh, with, with the help of um, a fellow named Ted Fujita from the University of Chicago and a lot of other researchers, what was the problem? And then the question becomes, how do we mitigate the problem? So one of the first steps in mitigation was the development of a system called the low-level wind shear alert system. This is a series of anemometers, of wind sensors, that are placed on poles around the airport. And by looking at the variation of the wind across this network, one can deduce where a micromers might be. If you go to, to the airport in Denver and look around a little bit, you'll see 32 of these poles sticking up around the Denver airport. So this is very good for figuring out where a microburst is sort of within this network of sensors. Another piece of the puzzle was something called the terminal Doppler weather radar. This is a radar that is able to look beyond the network of wind sensors and actually figure out where the microbursts are further out away from the airport. This work was done by a collaboration jointly between NCAR, MIT, Lincoln Labs, and others. Um, it was installed at 50 US airports that happened to have a high danger of wind shear and a lot of traffic. Um, and a lot of these systems have been deployed in one form or another internationally now. So these systems, along with training, have greatly reduced wind shear related accidents. Now this was an early, decision support tool that we developed. And uh, the tool, there were two versions of it. There was a graphical display, which the supervisors and managers 
uh, would look at, and they could see on that tool where the microburst was. If you see the, the, red, uh, the red ellipse there, uh, there's a microburst there, and, but the controllers themselves who were talking to the pilots really didn't want to have to look at a graphical display and figure out what it meant. So for them, for the controllers talking to the pilots on the radio, a different display was developed. It looks very simple, but, but actually developing it and, and figuring out how to translate what we knew into this message was not easy. So for example, if a United flight was arriving on runway 26, and this was happening, the controller would read this message. He would say, United 235, microburst alert, expect a 35 knot loss on a three mile final, wind 1004, clear to land. I can see that makes a lot of sense to all y'all. Clear to land, what do you mean clear to land? Um, I'm told that there was a case at Denver uh, at one time where there was a 90 knot microburst and the controller gave the message to the pilot and said, say intentions. And the pilot said, say again. <laughs> 90 knot loss. Pilot said, I think we'll go around. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, th but that provoked uh, some interesting discussion with, with the FAA about what controllers should and shouldn't do. Because the controllers weren't supposed to be making decisions for the pilots. They were just providing information. And in this case, the controller was nudging the pilot to say, you better make a decision, say intentions. So the controller got in a bit of hot water about that. Uh, we've ev evolved today so that a controller will never put a pilot onto an approach that has a microburst active on that approach. So they'll never have to, to do a go around. That's a whole lot safer situation. Was that 35 knots, is that tail versus head or just head versus still air? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we, we've been, we were successful. Here are the fatalities uh, that people were seeing on wind shear accidents. And there were, th there were several things that helped. This was not all one, uh, one thing. There was, um, of course, the TWR and LWAS. There was also before that pilot training. There was a wind shear training aid, and there was extensive pilot training uh, that was done by the airlines. And we were involved in helping put that together. Now, I would like to um, point out there are at least three people in the audience here that I know who were up to their necks in the Winchester program almost from day one. There's Cleon Bider sitting here on the aisle, and Bill Mahoney, and Bob Barron. Anybody else that I missed? I came in 91, and when I got here in 91, this problem was, was mostly a solved problem. So now let me let me turn the calendar forward to modern, more modern times. Uh, the wind shear problem, sort of a solved problem, but there are other weather things that impact the system. Now, the reason that weather is an issue is because, for the most part, it causes a hazard. In order to avoid the hazard, uh, we've learned to be very conservative in our decision making. And by being conservative in decision making, what we do is we introduce into the system delays. We reduce our capacity because we're being conservative. Uh, 10 million minutes in 2013 of weather-related delay in the system, two-thirds of that we think is avoidable if we could do a better job of forecasting and using those forecasts in the system. So the federal government is designing something called the Next Generation Air Transportation System. Uh, this national plan involves multiple agencies. Uh, the thing is, it can't work without better weather information. Not just better weather information, but that information has to be integrated closely into the air traffic management decision process. So safety, then, is always the controlling objective in aviation. The problem that we face is how to achieve safety while at the same time reducing delays, increasing capacity, improving efficiency, 
So we need to do a better job of precision forecasting the various hazards to flight. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to step through a number of the hazard areas, a number of the things that we have been working to try to do a better job of forecasting. So uh, these are some of the areas that we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at in-flight icing, turbulence, convective weather, uh, terrain-induced turbulence, winter weather, um, ceiling visibility. Starting out with icing. Now, for large commercial aircraft, by and large, in-flight icing is not a huge issue. Um, the airlines are very well protected. They, they run hot air off the jet engines, usually into the, into the wing, keeps the ice melted off. Uh, we very seldom hear of an icing accident with a large commercial aircraft. But there was one with a commuter aircraft in Roseland, Indiana, um, which sort of opened everybody's eyes up to the fact that icing was not just a problem for those of us who fly small GA aircraft. Uh, and it turns out there have been over 800 deaths over 20 years uh, in non-commercial aviation related to icing. So we have developed technology that has been deployed to National Weather Service, and it helps pilots understand where the hazard is and helps them make decisions to stay out of the hazardous area. The FAA estimates that we're preventing eight accidents a year and saving $60 million a year when one takes, makes the evaluation of the cost of life, which is, is sort of an uh, odd calculation the federal government likes to make. So what is this icing thing? Well, first of all, let me tell you that it doesn't start out as ice. We have an aircraft wing and we have little water droplets. These are water droplets, but they happen to be, they happen to be lower than, um, uh, the temperature happens to be lower than freezing. But they stay water until they impact the wing. And then these water droplets stick and they freeze as soon as they hit the aircraft. You've probably encountered this driving your car. And, and it's raining, and as soon as that rain hits your windshield, you've seen it freeze on the windshield. Well, this is exactly what's happening with structural icing on an airplane. Well, why do we care? Well, we care because two things happen. One thing that happens, the lift is generated on the wing by a smooth airflow over the wing. The ice disturbs that smooth airflow and we get less lift generated by the wing. At the same time, it's rough and it generates drag. So it gets us on two, on two fronts. It reduces the lift and increases the drag. And so it, we may get to the point where the power on the aircraft is not sufficient to maintain the altitude and the airplane begins to sink. So that's why icing is a problem. Here's a, uh, here's a video of a wing showing the icing buildup on that wing. Um, now, if you're flying along and you look out and you see that happening, you want to get out of Dodge right away, unless you have some way to get that ice off, like, uh, like inflatable boots on the wing or, or a, some sort of a chemical system on the wing. Uh, it's not a good place to be. Now I want to shift gears and talk about something else that's called icing. Oh, before I do that, let me show you. Let me just show you the products. So we have a couple of products. We have something called the current icing product. The current icing product is basically a diagnosis of where the icing is right now. And uh, so what we do is you pick an altitude um, and you pick a time. Well, in the case of current icing, it's now. Uh, and you can draw a flight path in, and then you can see a vertical cross-section of icing along that flight path. Now this is a picture of icing severity. By sliding the bar at the bottom to a different time, you can actually look at a forecast uh, that looks the same, except it's in the future. And then another piece of this puzzle is the icing probability. So it's the same kind of depiction with the vertical and horizontal depiction and the time slider 
But now we can say not only how severe is the icing, but how probable is the icing. All right, shifting gears. Here is a modern jet engine flying at flight level. This jet engine is ingesting lots of ice crystals. And as the ice crystals get into the engine, they begin to adhere to the, to the blades. And pretty soon, uh, things get so gummed up inside the engine that it may just stop. Imagine if you're flying on a large jetliner at flight level and all the engines just stop. Disconcerting. <laughs> so, um, so this is called high ice water content engine icing. Um, this is a phenomenon that has become much more prevalent as we have made aircraft engines more efficient. Uh, so the new, more efficient engines are more susceptible to this problem than a lot of the older engines. In fact, to the point that the FAA has had to issue special directives to people flying 787s and the new 747s with the newer engines, that uh, they're to stay uh, as much as 50 miles away from any thunderstorms, particularly on the downwind side. What happens is these ice crystals typically blow off the top of a thunderstorm in the anvil. This is optically, may be optically totally clear, so the pilot doesn't see it. But those ice crystals, those, those small crystals, are, are there saturating the atmosphere. Um, this is a global problem. It tends to occur a lot in a tropical air mass. So um, here are 67 engine icing events that Boeing analyzed just to sort of show you where they are. So this, has been a, this is an international problem. International organizations are all, all over this, and we have worked with NASA, the FAA, the Canadian uh, folks, uh, the, the Europeans, uh, the Australians, everybody is, is trying to deal with this problem. And we have developed an algorithm called Alpha, Algorithm for Prediction of High Water Areas. We now are running this over the North American domain, as well as over Australia uh, and the Indonesian area. Uh, the idea is for us as weather people to be able to predict areas where this kind of ice crystal behavior is likely to occur. Now there's another side of the research that's being carried out by the people who build engines to try to figure out how to modify engines so they're not so susceptible to the problem. So we're coming at this solution from two different directions. Fix the engines and figure out where it's happening in the atmosphere so we can avoid the areas. So uh, for the airlines, this is a big deal. Uh, I mean, they're being safe, but to do that, they're spending lots of extra fuel and lots of extra time going way around thunderstorms. And in some of the long oceanic flights, that's, that's an expensive proposition to avoid uh, all of this convective weather. We ran uh, several field programs. One of them we ran out of Darwin, Australia. Uh, and out of Darwin, we had a Falcon 20. Uh, and so when this kind of uh, weather was forecast, uh, we would send the Falcon 20 up and they would fly patterns uh, in this area and try to diagnose uh, whether or not we were getting it right uh, with Alpha. So um, this field program, again, was a combination of the Europeans, Canadians, uh, and the US. Shifting gears, a whole other set of problems for aviation, ceiling and visibility. Now, let me start out by saying a little bit about ceiling visibility as it relates to small aircraft. Now, it's not the, the size of the aircraft so much that's important, it's the qualification of the pilot. Uh, in general aviation, uh, the majority of pilots who fly GA aircraft are not rated to fly in instrument meteorological conditions. They're, they fly in what are called visual meteorological conditions. Uh, they fly visual flight rules, which means you've got to be able to look out the window and see what's going on. And once you get in a cloud, you can't do that. And unless you're trained for that, 
it's very easy to become spatially disoriented uh, and to lose the aircraft in the cloud. So for, for uh, a lot of GA pilots, ceiling visibility is a killer kind of problem. Um, so we're working hard to try to come up with solutions for pilots so that they'll make better decisions on when uh, to stay on the ground or when to avoid areas that, that are gonna likely cause them a CNV problem. Now on the other hand, for the airlines, ceiling visibility is not much of a safety issue. I mean, these guys know how to fly uh, with a low ceiling and, and uh, low visibility. Uh, oftentimes they're equipped to fly right down to zero, zero. Uh, the problem is that for the commercial world, whenever we have a ceiling and visibility problem, it immediately reduces the throughput of the airport. The capacity is reduced, we begin to get delays at the airport. Now one of the reasons for this is that typically on a pretty day, the, the airline may approach an airport and the controller will say clear it for the visual approach. Now once he does that, the pilot then is totally free to space the aircraft uh, in whatever manner they deem safe to land on that runway. They don't have the required kind of procedures and spacing. But as soon as that weather becomes instrument conditions, now the pilot has to follow instrument flight rules and that slows the system down. So uh, almost invariably, when we have a ceiling visibility problem at an airport, we will see the traffic at that airport slow down. Here's another problem. You may recognize the geography there, uh, New York City. Thunderstorm moving through. Look at what's happening out to the west. You see all those planes going in circles out there? Why are they doing that? <laughs> Didn't they know that they were going to uh, have to do something? They couldn't just go in and land in New York? Well, the answer is no, they didn't know because we didn't do a good enough job of forecasting with precision where and when this thunderstorm was going to affect the New York airports. So um, one of the R&D activities that the FAA has been funding for a while now is the development of a very accurate zero to eight hour forecast. And this was a joint effort of NCAR, MIT Lincoln Labs, and NOAA to put together this forecast, which now is being implemented as part of the next gen by a, a company called Raytheon. So Raytheon is essentially building the operational version of this forecast, which, which we have prototyped for a number of years uh, for the FAA and, and done statistics and verification on. Well, here's, a, here's another uh, classic problem ice on the aircraft prior to takeoff. Now the FAA <clears throat> frowns on taking off in an airplane with ice on it. Uh, the reason is it's uh, the same problem with getting ice on the aircraft in the air. It degrades the performance of the aircraft. So you've probably experienced this. You'll be at DIA in the winter time and uh, it's a winter situation. So before the aircraft can take off, they'll go out to a de-icing ramp and a truck will pull up Several trucks, in the case of Denver, will pull up and they'll start spraying this glop all over the airplane. There's sort of two steps to this. They spray something that will melt the ice off, and then they will spray something on that will inhibit the ice reforming. It's sort of like um, molasses. It's a thick gel kind of stuff. And that will keep the ice from reforming for a while. But if you get enough uh, snow falling on that wing and melting into that um, into that glop, pretty soon the glop will freeze. So now what do you have to do? You have to go back and start over again. Re-de-ice, reapply the, the anti-icing. So for this reason, uh, operating efficiently in the winter is much, much harder than other times of the year whenever you have snow and, and freezing precipitation to deal with. So, so they need decision support tools, and here's a tool that, that we developed to help uh, understand when they should de-ice 
and when they should refrain from de-icing and just wait for the weather. This is a um, this is an analysis with a short forecast indicated by those little barbs. Uh, those are 30 minute barbs. Uh, so they can kind of see what's happening, what's coming at them. And sometimes it's just smarter to not do anything. Just wait and, until the thing clears before you de-ice and try to get out. Um, now for the people doing the de-icing, a lot of times all they need is a very simple depiction. Um, now, let me explain to you that with snow, you know, when we, when we go out and look at, at snow, we sort of say, oh, we got, we got 14 inches of snow. Well, that's not exactly what's important for aviation. What's important for aviation is if you take that snow and you melt it, how much liquid do you get when you melt the snow? Because it's that liquid equivalent that dilutes the glop on the wing. So, uh, so it's very important then that we keep track of how much liquid equivalent has fallen on the wing after we've done the anti-icing fluid. Because we may have to go back and do it again. That period of time that's, that is predicted is called the holdover time. So there's a certain amount of time that, that you have to, that, that you're allowed before you have to go do it over again. So the guys who are doing the application are looking very carefully at how much snow is falling now because they know then what it's doing to dilute their de-icing fluid. Well, and then you also have the problem in the winter time of snow on the runways, on the taxiways, uh, breaking action on the runway. So uh, this is a whole other problem where the airlines are worried uh, about de-icing aircraft, the airports are worried about keeping the runways and taxiways serviceable. Now it turns out that we got some leverage here because the U.S. Department of Transportation had funded NCAR for road weather purposes to develop something called the Maintenance Decision Support System. This system is used by uh, highway departments in a number of states and it helps them make decisions about when to apply chemicals and plow roads in the states. Well, it turns out that a runway and a taxiway are not that much different than a highway. And so we've worked with airports, uh, for example, the city of Denver, to, to apply this same tool to, to their interior operation uh, inside the airport gates. So this is an example of what the decision support tool looks like as it's deployed at Denver, where you see the, the various runways, each managed separately with, with a history of treatment, a history of, of snowfall, and, and uh, what's happening on that runway. So each one is dealt with separately. Now, if you go into the operations center at the airport, you will see sitting side by side this uh, MDSS system, and beside that, you will see an aircraft de-icing display. So uh, the people in airport operations are sort of looking at both aspects of the problem. Here's another picture at Denver. Um, you probably recognize the, the famous bridge across to the A concourse. There's an interesting factoid about that bridge, by the way. The idea was that airplanes would be able to go under that, but they didn't really properly account for the tail height of all kinds of aircraft. <laughs> so the controllers have to be really careful which aircraft they route down that pathway. There's some that don't fit. Sort of like driving down the highway and you see the, the overpass and it says 16 foot, you know, one inch, and the truckers have to kind of be conscious of that. We'll talk about lightning. You know, when we talk about thunderstorms, we're typically thinking about flight. That is, the airplane is flying and we're trying to avoid thunderstorms. But at the airport, uh, lightning provides a different kind of problem. You have people on the ramp who are loading baggage, unloading baggage, fueling the airplane, uh, putting the food and drink on board. So the ramp is just full of people doing stuff to that airplane. Imagine what a few lightning strikes on that ramp uh, would do. And so uh, the idea is get people off the ramp 
before the lightning stripe happens. Now, in case, in case you don't think there's ever lightning on the ramp, watch this. Here's an airplane, lightning strikes the tail, now there's a manhole cover and it goes skittering across over here. And you see people going every which way. Wonder why they're running. Let's do that again. So we'll, now watch, right here is the manhole cover. Lightning strikes, goes through the airplane, manhole cover, there it goes. There it is right out there. These guys probably are gun shy at this point. They don't want to finish servicing that airplane. <clears throat> so um, the, the problem is that the FAA takes no responsibility for lightning on the ramp. That's, um, that's the airline's own personal uh, OSHA uh, worker safety problem. So every airline does it differently. Every airline has a different lightning source. They have different rules for when to get people off the ramp. That is, if the lightning is three miles from the field, five miles from the field, 10 miles from the field. And once they get them off the ramp, how long do they keep them off? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? So if you go to an airport like Denver and you watch, every airline is doing different things. There's no consistency across the airport. And we've observed this at other airports. So uh, this is an area that we're working with the FAA on to, to try to make a convincing argument that this is an area that they ought to be concerned about and interested in. It also has to do with traffic management uh, and delays in capacity, because as soon as you pull people off the ramp, suddenly everything comes to a halt. So now uh, that airport is part of a large network. So now you've stopped that airport, so people are coming in and landing, but they can't get to a gate, and, uh, and this ripples across the country. So, so there are big air, uh, impacts, not just to worker safety, but also to capacity and efficiency of the system. Watch this. Watch that drink card. And by the way, the passenger wasn't belted beside the drink card. Uh, <clears throat> this is a... Um, this is a very realistic simulation of uh, a turbulence event uh, in an aircraft. The, um, so, so the first moral of this story is keep your seatbelt fastened. Uh, notice the guy on the left does a lot better than the one on the right, <laughs> unless he gets hit by the drink card. <clears throat> um, turbulence encounters have a significant safety, efficiency, and workload uh, uh, impact on the airlines. Um, there are a number of pilot reported turbulence encounters. 75% of all weather related accidents and incidents are turbulence. Um, there is a huge cost to the US airlines due to injuries, uh, aircraft damage, cabin damage, flight delays, time loss because they have to inspect the aircraft and tear it down and look at it when they have severe turbulence. Um, interestingly enough, who do you suppose in the aircraft is the most susceptible to a turbulence injury? Flight attendants. Flight attendants. That's exactly right. The flight attendants, you see them running up and down the aisle doing stuff when the seatbelt sign is on and, and they're just trying to do their job and, and they're holding onto the seats as they're going down the, the aisle. For each of the major airlines, they're on the order of maybe between 300 and 400 major flight attendant injuries per year. By major, I mean the flight attendant has broken something, is hospitalized, is off of work. So this is a big uh, safety issue for the cabin crew. Uh, this is an area that, that we are working with the FAA and the airlines on to try to, to improve. So some of the things that we're doing in turbulence, um, Airplanes are very good sensors for turbulence. When they fly through it, they know it. And so uh, we have <coughs> equipped airlines, United, Delta, Korean, Southwest, with the ability to automatically report uh, the condition of the air as they, as they ride through the air. Uh, it's important not only where is the turbulence, but it's important to know where the turbulence isn't. Because where it isn't is where we'd like to be flying. So. Um, so these automated turbulence observations from the aircraft are extremely valuable to us in our forecasting process. Um, 
The turbulence is not easy to detect. Uh, in clear air, it, we really don't have good sensors that can sit on the ground and tell you where the clear air turbulence is. We can tell you where the turbulence is in cloud, but in the clear air, uh, the best sensor we have is the airplane that went in front of you. Now we take the aircraft data, we take data from models, we diagnose uh, the information, and we produce something called graphical turbulence guidance. This is very much like the icing product. Here you see a picture where you pick a, a flight level, uh, say 30, flight level 340, and you pick a time, and then you can draw a flight path through that, and you can see the vertical cross-section of turbulence across that flight path. Now this is an extremely good planning tool for the people who are planning flights. It's also an extremely good tool if the pilot can look at it in the cockpit. Uh, and so we're making inroads now and in finally getting the pilot uh, information that they can actually see uh, for themselves. Notice this aircraft. Turbulence. So um, from the biggest to the smallest, turbulence can be an issue. You know, drones are um, a big thing right now. But there are a lot of weather-related things associated with drones that we still are learning about. And one of them is how to deal with turbulence. So uh, we're doing work with NASA. Uh, they're trying to develop an automated control system for drones. And as part of that, they want to know what the turbulent situation is in the first 400 feet of the atmosphere above the ground. And, and so um, this is a new project. We're excited about it, uh, and we think it has a lot of potential. From the very smallest to the very largest scale, uh, we have turbulence all over the globe. On any day, uh, one can see turbulence in a lot of places. And so for flight planning for uh, airlines, they really would like to be able to flight plan someplace else other than where they're going to expect this turbulence. Here a good example is, you know, typically if you're going from San Francisco to, to Asia, you take off and you make a hard right turn and you fly right up the coast and around Alaska and down the Aleutians to get to Asia. You may wonder why you would take such a circuitous route. Well, the answer is it's not circuitous at all because the globe is round and the shortest great circle distance from the west coast to Asia is actually around the Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. But look at that turbulence up there. That's not a place that they want to be flight planning probably. So they're probably going to come in with another plan for those flights uh, going to Asia with this kind of a forecast. Here's another, uh, another kind of wind and turbulence related problem. You may remember on my birthday in uh, December of 2008, there was a Continental Airline that lined up on runway 34 right at Denver, applied power, and about halfway down the runway, you can see from the picture here on the top that they departed the runway and started heading across the pasture, skipped over a road, jumped over another road, landed in a uh, pond, a drainage, a, a drainage area at the airport, and the aircraft caught on fire and was destroyed. Everybody got out. There were injuries, but there were no fatalities in that accident. It's pretty amazing that there were no fatalities. So what happened? So here you see uh, a, a modeled uh, behavior of winds uh, in the vicinity of the airport. Right here where my cursor is, is where the airport is in relationship to the mountains. Now you'll notice on this day that a lot of the wind was, was screaming from the west and a lot of these, these uh, high winds were periodically sort of dipping down to the surface. And so, so when the pilot started the roll down the runway, there was probably no difficulty. But on the roll, they got a wind gust 
across that one runway. And if you look at the color scale here, this is in meters per second. A rough way to translate that into miles per hour is sort of double it. So, so we have a system here, you know, where maybe um, 40, 50 mile an hour winds suddenly gusting right across the runway during the takeoff roll. So there's no way the aircraft or the pilot could deal with that. Uh, oddly enough, we have instrumentation at the airport that uh, saw that, all of those LWAS sensors that I mentioned to you, you know, we could find LWAS sensors that showed that. The problem is that that data is not instantaneously available to the people who need to see it. I mean, the controller sees a roll up of all of that. The pilot doesn't, doesn't see that data. So one of the questions that we've been looking at is how could we do a better job of alerting for that kind of a condition? Here's another airport, picturesque airport. Anybody know where that one is? Juneau, Alaska, yeah. Juneau's a cute little town with no roads uh, into it. So the airport is the, is the way people get in and out of Juneau. Now, <clears throat> This airport is sort of down in a bowl. It has mountains kind of surrounding it. And um, sometimes at this airport, uh, the winds are such that they have to take off sort of the way you're looking down that picture, you know, facing uh, away from you. And you would say, well, that doesn't look too bad. You just take off and make a little right turn and go down that cute little channel there. But imagine that the visibility uh, and ceiling are, are not too good and you can't really see very well. And that's a pretty narrow channel to navigate. So when we first started work in Juneau, uh, the only way that they could get out of there uh, on those kind of days was they would do what was called a turning departure. Now, a turning departure, you, you see where the airport is on this, on this map, and you see those two turns. Um, now, the way this would work is so the pilots would get out of the runway, full throttle down the runway, take off, and as soon as you get off the ground, you gotta, you gotta pull the power back. You don't wanna go too fast because you wanna make a really tight turn, and the faster you're going, the, the, the larger your turn radius is. So pull the power back and, and go slow and make that turn as close to the ground as, as you can get started with it. Now imagine you got 10 knots at the airport and 100 knots at mountaintop height. And think about that airplane in that turn, sort of climbing through that layer. And imagine the airplane having a 95 degree roll 300 feet off the ground. Actually, that kind of thing happened. On one airplane, it happened twice. 95 degree roll recovery, 95 degree roll the other way. So probably not a whole lot of happy passengers on that flight. <laughs> So um, it turned out that um, the pilot on that flight got an award from the Airline Pilots Association for meritorious airmanship in saving the airplane. There was an FA inspector in the back of the room who got curious, what do you mean meritorious airmanship? So uh, the FAA intruded itself into the situation and started closing the airport down totally when the winds were adverse. So sometimes the airport would be shut down for days at a time in Juneau with no roads and the state legislature there. <coughs> Further imagine that you have a U.S. Senator named Ted Stevens <laughs> who was in control of appropriations on the Hill. So Senator Stevens sent the FAA a nice note and said, fix this problem, whatever it takes. And take it out of your hide, by the way. No extra money. So, uh, of course, the FAA was overjoyed. They came to NCAR and asked us to take a look at this because we had just finished doing the Hong Kong airport. Uh, Hong Kong airport has somewhat similar problems, except not quite as complex as Juno. It's sort of one mountain on one side of the runways causing most of the problems in Hong Kong. But we had built a system, custom designed for Hong Kong. Bill Mahoney was the project manager on that project. Uh, and we were successful in getting it done. So the FAA said, look at Juno and see what we can do. Uh, 
So we flew a lot of aircraft in Juneau. We put in sensors. We had uh, anemometers at the top of the mountains. We had wind profilers, which are vertically pointing radars that can, uh, that can see the wind uh, layers and the wind at different altitudes. So with that system, uh, we were able to devise a set of alerts so that whenever the conditions were dangerous, we would give the pilots alerts and they learned not to take off when they got an alert. So I'd like to use Juno as an example of sort of an end-to-end -end project where we started out doing a lot of science. That is, we, had, we were focused on turbulence. We had to do a lot of field research and gather a lot of data and analyze it to understand the problem. Uh, we collaborated with the FAA, with the Weather Service, universities, Alaska Airlines. Uh, in that field program, we flew airplanes. We flew both, both the, the Wyoming King Air, the Citation um, from UND. Uh, Alaska Airlines flew their 737. We had the Doppler on wheels up there uh, gathering data. Uh, we had anemometers that were specially designed to work in that environment, and we had to test those anemometers. Uh, a lot of engineering, uh, software development, web applications, maintaining the sensors and operating them in the field, validating all of this with a sponsor. There in the middle, you see a picture of one of our anemometer sites at Sheep Mountain. This is an example of what it's like in the wintertime up there. Um, so it was a real hassle keeping all those mountaintop anemometers working uh, in the wintertime. In the bottom, you see one of the wind profilers, vertically pointing radars, sitting in the middle of a muskeg swamp. It's where it needed to be. So that was an, an interesting exercise. This involved tech transfer, system hardware and software provided to the FAA so that they could build from our prototype the in-state system. Uh, we had three generations of prototypes. The reason we did was, in Hong Kong, it took us 44 months to do that project. In Juneau, it took us 16 years. The problem really wasn't that much harder than Hong Kong. It was that we were fighting the FAA at every turn of the road. They didn't want the system. They didn't want to maintain it. They didn't want to deal with it. And so they would stop the funding. We would move all the people off the project. Then the funding would come back, and we would move the people back on the project again. So we restaffed that project, I think, three times on the 16 years. But finally, uh, we turned the system over to the FAA in 2012 for operations and maintenance. This is a picture of the display. One of the things that happened while we were up there was the technology improved for uh, guiding the aircraft. They used a GPS, high precision approach, and they could go up and down that little channel. And everybody thought, well, that's going to fix the problem. Um, you don't have to do the turning departures anymore. The problem is, when you're in that little channel, uh, there's a lot of turbulence in that little channel, too, enough sometimes to knock the autopilot offline. And so now the pilot's flying in the clouds in that little channel, autopilot kicks off. So that's not a good place to be. So uh, it turned out that forecasting and alerting on the turbulence in the channel was just as important as for the turning departures. Here's another atmospheric problem. Anybody recognize that? What was the atmospheric problem here? Birds flying in the atmosphere. Now, <coughs> You may wonder why we're, we're interested in this. Well, of course, it's an aviation hazard. There are a lot of people killed with bird strikes every year, a high cost to the system. But radar turns out to be a pretty good detector of birds uh, if you use it right. So we were working with a system mm -hmm. called Detect uh, who had developed a bird radar system. And this bird radar system was on a trailer and could be deployed and moved around the airport to try to understand where the birds are, where they're going, what areas do we need to worry about in, in terms of bird control around the airport. So this is an ongoing <coughs> problem, not solved yet, <clears throat> but uh, that's how the atmospheric science community got involved in bird strikes. 
The Aviation <laughs> Digital Data Service. This is a website that NCAR developed uh, with FAA funding. Uh, it was probably the best um, source of aviation weather information for pilots, dispatchers, and others. This system was prototyped and operated on an experimental basis here for many years. Uh, and eventually we were able to complete a tech transfer of this system to the National Weather Service. So now it runs totally in an operational mode at Kansas City uh, as part of the Aviation Weather Center. Um, we know that uh, the number of hits per day uh, last time we, we looked was somewhere in the order of 20 million hits a day, uh, 500,000 visits a day, and a lot of data, uh, 300 gigabytes of data uh, spewed out of the site on a daily basis. It's a great website. Now one of the, <clears throat> the other things we did with the website was there, there was a, a rash of helicopter emergency management um, service helicopter accidents. The helicopters got in trouble. Uh, they were flying in, they, they scud run. That's the way they get around. They try to stay under the ceiling and, and go slow enough to deal with the visibility. So Congress was all over the FAA's case and they came to us and said, could you guys meet with the helicopter operators and come up with something in the weather world to improve their operation? So after we did that and worked with the users, we developed a tool that was part of the ads website for these operators to use. Uh, that tool now is also running operationally, been transferred to the weather service to run. Here's a picture of some dispatchers who are dispatching these, these emergency service helicopters, and they're sitting there looking at their HEMS tool, trying to make decisions on dispatching. Uh, you may recognize uh, this flight track from Rio de Janeiro to Paris. Uh, this was Air France 447. This aircraft um, flew into this convective uh, activity, and, and we lost the aircraft. Now, there are a lot of problems with this, but, but I assert that if the aircraft had not flown into that system, we wouldn't have lost the aircraft. And other aircraft were diverting around it, but uh, the pilot had no good display in the cockpit other than the radar. So they, didn't, they couldn't sort of look left and right and see what their options were. So they went through the middle. Uh, every day you see these convective systems all over the world, and pilots need help to try to avoid this stuff. So one of the, the beauties of, of current technology is we can take an iPad, we can put that on the internet using the wireless of the aircraft, we can uh, put weather data up on that iPad attached to the cockpit, and the pilot can see weather that's just as good as the people on the ground can see. This is the first time that pilots have actually known as much about the weather they're flying through as the people on the ground know about the weather. We're doing this with Lufthansa Airlines. They're flying our, our product on their uh, aircraft on the oceanic flights and uh, we're getting a lot of good, uh, good feedback from Lufthansa on this uh, tablet. Um, finally, uh, let me just mention, uh, to do all this weather stuff, you've got to have a lot of data, and you've got to be able to move it where you need it. You've got to be able to access it efficiently and effectively. So for a number of years, we've been working with the FAA on a program originally called Next Gen uh, in new next gen network, network enabled weather. Now we change the name to hide. You know, you change the name oftentimes. It's now called Common Support Services Weather. The idea is to collect weather data from everywhere, bring it into a common repository, virtual repository, and then be able to provide the needed information to anybody in the aviation business who needs the data. This is now a completed prototype. Harris Corporation is under contract at the FAA to build this prototype based on work that was done here at NCAR, uh, at MIT Lincoln Labs, and at NOAA. So finally, in closing, we have a long history serving the aviation community. We've made fundamental improvements in the understanding of aviation weather hazards and the science behind those hazards. 
And in the process, we've developed a broad array of tools and systems that reduce our overall vulnerability to the weather. We really appreciate your coming to see us today, and uh, we'll have a Q&A session and be glad to, to try to answer any questions that people may want to pose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Are there any questions? Regarding clear air turbulence, uh, I was under the impression that some commercial aircraft have the capability to detect turbulence out ahead of them. I noticed that some of the commercial flights I'm on now slow down way ahead of time. So, um, <clears throat> so the new radars um, have the ability to detect turbulence in cloud. Uh, but in terms of clear air turbulence, no. Uh, the radars do not have the ability to detect the clear air turbulence. Wasn't there a company in Longmont a couple of years back that was developing a clear air turbulence detector? There is a li the LIDAR is able to, to look ahead and detect turbulence a sh very short distance. Uh, but the airlines are not implementing LIDARs on their aircraft, and the distance that you see forward with the LIDAR is so short that it, it's not cost effective. So there, so we have to use other means for dealing with clear air turbulence. Dr. Carmichael, I have a brother that's a pilot for Delta Airlines. I was actually texting him during your talk, and uh, he mentioned that automatic uh, turbulence detection system you're talking about. He says, actually, they have it now. Yes. Which, as you probably know, he says he can't use it for two more weeks, but he's excited about it. Um, I asked him a couple days ago, I said I was coming to this talk, I said, do you have any questions? And he kind of whimsically said, well, ask the guy when the system's going to automatically turn the seatbelt sign on and off for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it sounds like the clear air turbulence problem still hasn't been licked. Are there any other issues there that you guys can help the guys up front figure out what to do to keep passengers and flight attendants safe? Well, so uh, one of the things that we have been doing, and, and Delta has been our guinea pig with this, is we, we've been working with them to have a tablet in the cockpit that has specifically turbulence information on it so that, so that they can help, uh, the tablet can help them in the decision-making process for turbulence. Now, we have a product that's going onto that, onto that display that we're continually enhancing. Uh, we have a, a new product called Graphical Turbulence Guidance Nowcast. And by Nowcast, we mean that we're taking the current state of the world, as we understand it, and implementing it into that tablet. So it's not just a forecast, but what's going on in front of you right now. And that includes the radar information from in-cloud uh, radar uh, reports. So we get the in-cloud radar information, we get satellite data, we have other aircraft reports, we have model data. Anything that you could think of that, that we can use as an indicator of turbulence is built into that system. Now let me <coughs> say another word about the, the notion of turning on the seatbelt sign. Um, we are working on a project with the FAA called Tactical Turbulence. And the notion behind that uh, project is that when the pilot suddenly finds themselves in a situation where they're going to hit turbulence, it's going to happen no matter what, then there needs to be an action taken quickly. And so this system would provide an alert just says, turbulence, batten down the hatches. It's not designed for the pilot to try to avoid it. It's saying, you're going to hit it. So button down the hatches, get the flight attendant seated, move quickly. So we've been, uh, the first step on that is to simulate it in a, in a simulator at the FAA Technical Center in Atlantic City, prove whether or not it really works. Is this the kind of thing that pilots want and that they will use? So, uh, so that system may be part of the answer uh, to the idea of turn on the seatbelt sign. Are the aircraft manufacturers themselves um, modifying the planes so that they could be more uh, stable or, uh, I guess, less prone to those downdrafts or microbursts or in the outflows? Yeah, the the, uh, the aircraft flight systems are designed to um, to do some mitigation uh, of the turbulence to to react to the turbulence as they encounter it, so the aircraft behaves better in turbulence. NASA has done work 
actually using uh, LIDARs to look at a very short distance ahead of the aircraft and have active controls uh, that that LIDAR is, is essentially providing the sensing data for, where the controls can quickly uh, react to the turbulence just before you hit it. So there, there is work going on on the aircraft side to try to mitigate the turbulence to some extent. But I think it's going to be a long time before we get to the point where we can just turn any airplane uh, through any kind of turbulence and expect a good outcome. Yeah, so I've got two questions, um, if I may. One, can you talk a little bit about the process where you collectively, the community, identified the microburst? You've talked about once you had the concept that the accidents occurred, because of a microburst and how you measure. But it seems to me somebody took a lot of unrelated data and said yeah. in a moment, aha, now let's yeah. prove it. So, so let, me, uh, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about a fellow named Ted Fujita. Fujita was a professor at University of Chicago. He was a scientist, but he was um, an observational scientist. That is, he liked to just look at, at nature and sort of in his mind, try to deduce what he was seeing. And he would go out and look at these accident sites, and he would see patterns in the grass, uh, in, the, in the vegetation. And he was looking at this saying, you know, it looks to me like what happened here is this kind of a thing. Um, he, was, uh, he was a Japanese fellow who survived the uh, atomic bomb uh, attacks in Japan. And he recalls seeing patterns similar to this. And so in his brain, this is all clicking, you know. So a lot of the community said he was crazy. I mean, <laughs> what's this guy going down and looking at grass that's been blown over and thinking, you know, that, that he knows what's going on. But that was really the aha moment was Fujita saying, this is what I see when I observe nature after the fact. And later on, the scientists finally kind of figured it out that, yeah, he was right. So that was, that was kind of the process. Okay. Second question, somewhat unrelated. You had talked about, I think, the Alpha program that had highly accurate forecasting one to eight hours out. No, that was, that's COSPA. OK. Yes, it's a, it's a convective so, weather, a, a thunderstorm forecast. So the question is, how accurate is highly accurate? Um, and two, uh, how do you know? And what kind of feedback? You've talked about uh -huh. everything but sort of feedback and data gathering. Well, one of the great about things uh, about thunderstorms is that it's really easy to do verification because you can use radar data of what actually happens to verify the forecast you made about what you thought was going to happen. So that's one of the one of the nicest uh, verification problems that we have. So it's easy, relatively easy for us to, to tell you uh, accurately how good a job we're doing. Now, like all other kinds of forecasts, uh, I guarantee you that our five minute forecast is better than our eight hour forecast, right? So the further out we go in time, the less accurate the forecast is. Um, but Compared to uh, other information that operators have now, it's a big improvement. So um, we've done cost-benefit studies in the community. Uh, independent organizations have done, done cost-benefit studies, and they show a significant dollar improvement from using the more accurate forecast. So um, not all the way there, uh, but it's an open-ended architecture so that as we get smarter, we can make the forecast smarter. I just draw something for you. It's this. I can't quite see what it is. These spots on the wings are the cold snow that is sticking to it. 
And these little spots over here inside the engine is where the cold spots are going inside the propeller over here. All right, so, so we've captured icing here. We have icing on the wings, and we have icing in the engine. That's very good. So you, you heard all that when I was talking about it. So we have icing on the wing, and we have ice inside the engine. Good, thank you. Are there any other questions? And this might be a really stupid question. There is no stupid question. Do microbursts only occur low to the ground, or do they only affect airplanes low to the ground? So, so a microburst, what happens is you, you have a thunderstorm, and, and out of the bottom of that thunderstorm, you have the microburst. So the microburst is occurring aloft and falling toward the ground. Now, the, the thing is, it really only is a major hazard to airplanes as it nears the ground. Uh, if you're flying in an airplane through a microburst at a higher altitude, it's not uh, that much of a hazard. But close to the ground, typically when you're landing or taking off, you have the wheels down, you have the flaps out, the airplane is going slow, and so you don't have much margin for error when you're taking off or when you're landing. Uh, at altitude, you're, you know, you're flying quite a bit faster, uh, and you're not getting the spreading of the microburst uh, up aloft. It's just almost a straight down kind of phenomenon. Yes, sir. Is there, is there a way to shorten the delay in radar information that we get through ADSB and XM weather? Yes. And I'll tell you what it is. <clears throat> so what you see is you take the radar data and it goes through a fair amount of processing. Uh, and that processing induces latency, perhaps 10 minutes. Let's just use 10 minutes as an example. Um, and then you, you look at it. Now, <clears throat> you've probably heard people say, you know, you got to be really careful in using that onboard radar data because it's got a latency in it. So don't make tactical decisions based on that data. Well, there's another solution. We are really, really good at very short-term forecasting, five minutes, 10 minutes. So what if we send the data to the aircraft so that we display the forecast at the time the pilot is viewing the data? So if the pilot's viewing the data, we essentially use the extrapolation that corresponds to the viewing time. Now we take the latency out. And those forecasts are very accurate. They're a whole lot more accurate than looking at 10-minute old data. So yes, there is a solution. We have made a proposal to the FAA to implement such a solution, and we're waiting to hear whether or not they want to do it. Great. Uh, in terms of the the four manufacturers or the <coughs> sorry the four airline companies, um, do you get the data from the flight instrumentation, or do you get data from your own sensor infrastructure. Now, you're talking about the turbulence data? Correct. So here's the way that works. Um, the aircraft already is well equipped to sense uh, the winds that it's flying through. And so what we do is we can take that wind data that's already on the aircraft, and we can run it through an algorithm that resides on the aircraft that converts that to turbulence. So there's no extra sensors required. There's, no extra, there's nothing except some software that gets loaded on the aircraft. And then that information is downlinked uh, via uh, whatever communications mechanism the airline is using for downlinking information and goes directly to the weather service. Any other questions? Well, if there's no more questions, thank you again for coming.